Good afternoon and welcome to Family and Community Medicine uh, Ground Rounds, um, as well as the Creday uh, lecture today. Um, I'm incredibly excited to welcome you and to hear from our speaker, uh, Dr. Giran Wintemute. Um, just as a reminder, today's session is being recorded um, and this is a webinar style talk. So um, uh, if you have questions or comments for uh, Dr. Wintemute, uh, please use the please use your Q and A session, uh, your Q and A box to fill things in, and we will um, uh, read them. And uh, he seems very excited to answer a lot of those questions live, which will be fantastic. I'm sure there'll be great dialogue on today's topic. Um, uh, also, as a reminder, um, there'll be an evaluation posted if you want to fill out an evaluation. So um, comments for our speakers or for grand round, just in general, grand rounds in general. Um, and finally, if you uh, want to see today's session again, or if you missed previous Grand Round sessions and you'd like to review them, um, they're uploaded uh, onto the Family and Community Medicine website, um, and you can watch them through YouTube. Uh, so for today, again, very exciting Grand Rounds today. Um, this is the uh, Creday Lectureship. The Creday Lectureship uh, honors uh, Dr. Robert Creday, who is a professor of medicine at UCSF and really a national champion for primary care. Um, Dr. Creday was a UCSF School of Medicine graduate. Um, he did his internship at San Francisco General Hospital and his residency in medicine with us. Um, he was a key person in establishing the ambulatory and community medicine clerkship at UCSF, as well as the division of ambulatory and community medicine that was really the forerunner of the Department of Family Medicine and um, uh, in internal medicine, the division of general internal medicine. He really changed a pre-doctoral and post-doctoral medical education in a very substantial way to emphasize a comprehensive approach to all patient problems, especially in the ambulatory care settings. Um, uh, the honor of hosting the Creday Lecture is shared and rotated by the Division of General Internal Medicine in the Department of Medicine, um, also the Department of Family and Community Medicine, and the Division of General Pediatrics in the Department of Peds. Um, so our speaker today, again, who I'm very excited to hear from, is uh, Dr. Garen Wintemute. Uh, Dr. Wintemute is a distinguished professor of emergency, <clears throat> excuse me, of emergency medicine. Um, uh, and the Baker Terrett Chair in Violence Prevention at the University of California, Davis. Um, and he is our uh, Creday lecturer for today. Um, Dr. Wittemute originally trained as a biologist at Yale, um, and he attended medical school and did a family medicine residency at UC Davis, where he studied epidemiology and injury prevention, um, subsequently at John Hopkins. Uh, Garen is the founding director of the Violence Prevention Research Program at UC Davis and the California Firearm Violence Research Center, which is the nation's first publicly funded center for research in this field. Um, and he has worked towards overcoming formidable political obstacles to develop and sustain a major research program on gun violence as a public health emergency um, and really pursue effective approaches to firearm safety. Um, Garen practices and teaches emergency medicine at UC Davis Medical Center. His talk today is firearm violence, where we stand, what we can do. I think all of us are aware that this is an incredibly timely talk for us all, including what's on the front page of the Chronicle today. When I mentioned that to Garen before, uh, before, before the session, he said, yes, this has been a timely topic for the past 35 years. So I am eager to hear uh, his perspective, his experience, and particularly what we can all do as, uh, as a healthcare community to become more involved. So it's my pleasure to, walk, uh, to welcome Dr. Garen Wintemute. Thanks. Margo, thanks very much. Um, hi, everybody. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here. Let me share my screen and we will get to business. Um, I'm going to move pretty quickly. Uh, just a fair warning, the slides are going to be available. I want to save a lot of time for discussion. Um, it must be mentioned that I have no disclosures. Now let's get on to the talk. Um, it used to actually be something of a hard sell to persuade people that violence was a public health problem. The best articulation I've ever seen or read uh, came from Dr. David Satcher. This is it, 25 years ago and then some, when rates of violence were actually far higher than they are today. Um, and I would argue that we've moved somewhat past the thinking that violence is a public health problem to understand it as a health problem, a social problem, a humanitarian problem that has causes and consequences at the individual and the population and the structural levels 
And I'm gonna to touch on all of those um, over the course of the talk. And I'm gonna end spending some time on um, what we all can do, what you all can do. I'm gonna get quite concrete about that. Um, but let's keep it with public health for a moment uh, and look at some data. These are the most recent data available. Uh, 2020 will be available probably next month. I'm gonna see several slides that look like this. So I'm gonna give you the setup first and then we'll dive into what's actually displayed. Um, the y-axis is deaths per 100,000 population. We're looking at rates here by age and by race ethnicity for men. Simply for the sake of time, I do not have the slides for, for women up to show, but I'm happy to give them to anybody who'd like to see them. This first slide is an image that you're familiar with even if you've never seen it. Um, this displays the truly horrific concentration in risk for homicide among young black men and young men of color more generally. I'm gonna circle back to this several times. Um, I am gonna point out that as awful as this is with rates nearing 100, um, 25 years ago when to 30, when David Satcher uh, made his remark, the situation was much worse. And homicide, firearm homicide rates for African-American men in their early 20s peaked out at nearly 160 uh, per 100,000, at which time the rate for white men that same age was approximately six. But here's suicide. Same display. Um, note first off that the y-axis tops out at 50, not 100. Um, as with homicide, risk goes up early, um, but it doesn't go rapidly down thereafter. Um, it plateaus for Black and, and Hispanic men, more or less. Um, and for white non-Hispanic men, it continues to go up and then it goes up even faster. So some commonalities and some differences. Gender matters, you don't see that because I don't have the slide for women, um, but age clearly matters, but not in the same way. Um, and race ethnicity clearly matters, but not in the same way. What I'm gonna do now is combine the first two slides. And we're looking at death rates for firearm violence. Let's parse this one out a bit. Um, Y-axis tops out at 120, about 90% of deaths from firearm violence in black men are from homicide. So this is the curve you saw two slides back, plus 10% for black men, um, showing essentially the homicide pattern. Nearly 90% of firearm deaths among white, white non-Hispanic men are suicide. So that, that seemingly horizontal green line is the trending upward line you saw a couple slides back, plus 10%. But its position on the, in the image has been altered by the much higher rates of fire, death from firearm violence among black men. I know all of you are, are with me. Um, if we were in a webinar format, I'd ask for a shade, show of hands, but everybody raises their hand. What I'm gonna do now is alter the presentation a little bit. The traditional public health approach to a problem is risk-based. Let's figure out who's at highest risk, because if that risk is malleable, we'll get the greatest bang for the buck if we focus on the high risk population. We're all accustomed to thinking that way. But there is a complementary approach to problems that is burden based. It asks not just what is the risk at the individual level, but what does the population experience? And in order to go from risk to burden, to go from individual to population level exposure to firearm mortality, all I have to do is take the denominator away. So that if instead of looking at deaths per 100,000, we'll simply look at deaths. And that's what I'm gonna do in the next slide. So deaths per 100,000 to deaths. Risk and burden, risk and burden. I can do this toggling all day. 
Here's the point. Here are several points. First off, as the people who advocate a population health approach uh, uh, em emphasize, a plurality, even a majority of adverse health events can occur in a low risk population if that population is big enough. As it applies here, what we see is that beginning in the 30s, first a plurality, and then shortly after a majority of people who die of men, excuse me, who die from firearm violence in the United States are white non-Hispanic men. These are suicide deaths. Suicide is nearly twice as common as homicide among firearm deaths. The reason I emphasize this, I emphasize it for several reasons. Um, one is to remind us all to broaden our focus and think about suicide as well as homicide. And, and when we talk about what we can do clinically, I will come back to that. But the other is this, I am, I am still a clinician. I will be working a shift tomorrow night, um, but I also work in policy. And I have learned over nearly 40 years of doing the work that one of the reasons we've made so little progress on the policy level is that people who tend to make up a large percentage of policymakers look at the people they think to be at risk for firearm violence, focusing on homicide, and think, though they don't say it out loud, those aren't my people. I don't have a problem here. It's not my problem. And I use an image like this and the data behind it to say, you want to bet? One last data slide, and I'm talking to you as family docs, which is how I trained, as Margot pointed out. This is something that gets very little attention. Notice the nearly 15 year period of childhood during which even for the group at highest risk for death from firearm homicide, pretty much nothing is happening from a mortality point of view. But it is during this same time that lear the learning occurs that underlies and the exposure to social determinants, we will come back to that, occurs that underlies the increase in mortality that begins on the right side of the curve. We spend far too little time attempting to change what occurs during this seemingly quiescent period that sets up the period of tragedy that follows. We'll come back to that too. Okay, um, the next slide is visually disturbing. Heads up. Let's talk, shall we, about where we really are, um, what the last couple of years have been like, but in a context, the context of a talk on firearm violence. We're all still living through it. The, by the way, the test positivity rate for my hospital and clinic system is well above 30% yesterday. Um, we ain't done with this yet, um, but we all know this. We've had two years and counting of a pandemic, of an extended time of fear and loss and grief and uncertainty as the pandemic loomed and then arrived and we've, as we've all lived through it. Beginning late spring 2021, we had police violence and reaction to that police violence. We had increases in violence across the board. I'm gonna show you the detail of that in just a second. Um, I would argue, and many others do, that through much of this time in 2020, we had a near absence of effective leadership um, at the federal level. Um, and then in an elect, we had in an election year, um, I, and I'll tie that to the next slide when we get to the next slide, but you'll recall last year, we had a federal election. We have those every four years, but for the first time ever, we had a disputed election, an election that culminated um, in my view and the views of, of others in an incitement to an assault on the Capitol by the then sitting president, which occurred, just to remind us, a year ago yesterday. So here's another part of what happened last year and actually this year. You're looking, I study 
a lot of things having to do with firearm violence, including firearm purchasing. And what we're looking at here is trends in national instant criminal background check system, background checks for the purchases of firearms from 2014 through last week, through the end of December of 21. Your tax dollars at work. The data for December were available on the first working day of January. Um, on the left are the observed trends year over year through since 2014. Notice there's a spike at the end of every year. That's Christmas buying. Um, there's a spike every spring. That's buying for hunting and other sorts of sports activities. Note the prominent spike at the end of 2016. Federal elections are always a stimulus to gun purchasing because they create policy uncertainty. And oh, by the way, this last time, the gun control guy won. So what we see beginning in 2020, as uncertainty loomed and then crashed, um, is an increase, uh, a, a very substantial increase in background checks for gun purchases. We don't actually have a count of purchases. What we can count is background checks. Far and above expected levels based on the performance of the past few years. Um, took off early in the year, it dropped off in late spring. It crescendoed again in the summertime as rates of violence um, increased, a resurgence of, of uncertainty, a concern about unrest. <clears throat> there was another spike, uh, but it's sort of muted here by comparison. At the end of last year, there was a spring spike as usual um, in 2021, and things came back down. And it's only literally been in within the last two months that the gap has closed. There have been tens of millions of excess purchases of firearms. Um, if we extrapolate from background checks, colleagues did a study looking at uh, the period of time from January of 2019 through April of 2021. Um, so not the entire period that I'm highlighting here and extending to before that time. Um, and they estimated that nearly 3% of American adults became new gun owners, first time gun owners um, during that time. And I, I won't go further into their findings, but um, just let me say millions of households were exposed for the first time um, to the presence of firearms. And if somebody would like the details, I'll be happy to, to forward the link of the paper to the paper, excuse me. So here's where we are. Let's take the top bullet first. Homicide rates, homicide is the type of violent crime that most commonly involves firearms. Homicide rates rose by as much as 30% from 2019 to 2020, the first essentially full pandemic year. That's a, a relative increase. That's not 30 percentage points in absolute terms. It's a 30% increase. That year to year increase far exceeds anything ever seen in the entire history of federal mortality statistics going back to the 1920s. We have reasonably reliable mortality data going back a century, and we have never seen anything like this. Best estimate, we do not have final data, is that there's been a further roughly 15% increase in homicide in 2021. Higher in some major cities, Chicago reported just this week that its homicide count, not rate, and the city has grown is higher than at any time um, since the 1990s, a point, of, uh, a point in time that I referenced earlier. But there's a new element to the story, and I'm sure you've already read the rest of the slide. Hate crime is up, at least in California where we have good data, hate crime was up by 30% essentially in 2020. We don't have 2021 data, but what's new is the advent of political violence, January 6th as it's in, of last year as an example, and concern for political violence to come, which I will be talking now about for a bit. 30% of adults, and this is um, repeated public opinion polls, including some published just this week, confirm this finding. 30% of adults in the United States, not Republicans, adults, think that President Biden is not legitimately in 
the White House, that his, his election was a result of voter fraud. 15% of adults, one adult in six in the United States, endorses the quote that I won't bother reading out loud. 10% of adults, about 25 million people, endorse the use of force now, today, to restore Donald Trump to the White House. 10% of adults is larger than any army in existence. And I'll just mention, we're gearing up for some survey research that's going to take that line of questioning much further and try and find out just how ready people are to start pulling the trigger on um, uh, fellow Americans. Um, almost a year ago, in the spring of 2021, the domestic terrorism community started calling this out. The federal agencies that studied domestic terrorism really started ringing a fire bell in the night about this before most of the polling data came along. They were monitoring internet chat. Um, and I'm gonna give you one quote that's too long to put here. Um, one expert put it this way, um, nine months ago now, a lot of people want to see January 6th, referring obviously to, to 2021, as the end of something. I think we have to consider the possibility that this was the beginning of something. And I would argue that events since that year, um, events this week have made, have documented, have established that that was a very prescient statement to make. So let's talk about what to do. Up until recently, this, this part of the talk had one theme. Now it has two. I'm going to talk first about what we all can do, what you can do in your traditional role as a physician, seeing patients, what you can do with patients one at a time about firearm violence prevention. The first thing is you can make a commitment to step up and be part of the solution. Be someone who will help address this problem. Um, we all know how health, how health education works. Don't make that commitment to yourself. Make it out loud, make it in public. Tell your friends, create an accountability mechanism. Study up, sure. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit. Um, I doubt that there's, there are very many people at, attending this talk who are comfortable enough with firearms to walk right in and have the talk, who are comfortable enough with how to prevent firearm violence in clinical encounters. Well, that's fine. Who knew anything about COVID at the beginning of 2020? Studying up is part of our job and it's gotten much easier. And I'll, I'll talk to you about that um, in just a second. When it's appropriate, and we will talk about that on the next slide, raise the issue with your patients. Be tailored and flexible, respect their point of view, work with the patient, having all, at all times the patient's safety as your mutual health and safety, as your mutual objective, and find ways that you and the patient can work forward, um, whatever the, your differences about firearms in society might be. And I will, I will get quite specific about this on the next slide. You have some concrete goals, I would argue. One is, if it's on the table from the patient's perspective, to discuss acquisition of firearms. Should there be acquisition, should there be firearms in this home? in general, or maybe right at this moment because there's a crisis. Um, to improve storage, if firearms are going to stay in this home, and as I just mentioned, if there is a crisis, to do something about access. You can ask. I suspect a number of people think, wait a minute, there's a law, there's a practice, there's something, I'm really not allowed to do that. Let me tell you just straight up, that is a myth. There was never, ever a law that forbade clinicians, let alone physicians, from asking their patients about firearms or recording the answer. Not even in Florida. People in the audience may have heard about the Florida law that said you can't ask, et cetera. Um, and what the law said was you shouldn't ask and you shouldn't record the answers. But in the very next paragraph, it said, but if it's relevant to the patient's health and safety, well then go ahead, do both. Um, and why would we ask questions when it's not relevant? So <clears throat> as you look at 
no, actually, let me spend a minute on this. So the key is to bring the issue up when it's of value in the near term to bring it up. Um, sometimes the situation presents itself and makes it very clear. Violence is part of the encounter. But at other times, there are risk factors that you will encounter or you will know about them in your patient. And I've listed them there, I'm not gonna repeat them, but I will emphasize one of them. Depending on the situation, the risk factors might not be present in the patient, um, but in somebody in the patient's household. Maybe it's the partner, maybe it's the grandparent, et cetera. Um, there are demographic risk factors. We've talked about them. They function differently depending on the type of violence. But there's no need to ask, or there's no urgent need to ask the questions about guns in the home. If there's no risk, why waste the time? Talk about smoking or something else. Um, okay, here's how. Um, rather than read this through, because I've kind of alluded to it, I'm going to give you an example, and then I'm going to mention something about that last bullet point. Um, I work in an emergency department when this where this situation comes up once a shift at least. Um, I'm having a conversation with somebody, and however it happens in that conversation, risk arises. Maybe violence is why they're there. Um, maybe I've uncovered uh, ideation of harm to self. Maybe I've uncovered a dispute with a partner. Maybe I've uncovered alcohol, whatever it might be. The conversation has brought up some risk factors for violence. I will then say, and I will typically, if I happen to be in an unfast kind of confrontive position, I will shift so that I'm sitting alongside the patient, not as close to them as I used to, and maybe behind, and definitely behind mask and goggles, but I shift position and say, you know, what we've talked about has me a little bit concerned about the possibility of violence. And when that happens, I need to ask some further questions about things that might involve risk for violence, you know, questions about guns in the home and things like that. So tell me, do there happen to be any guns in the home? That's the end of the example. I've asked the question in a non-confrontational way. I've made it clear that my question is arising out of a perception on my part that there may be risk, so it's relevant. That perception came from information that the patient gave me. And finally, notice I slipped in the word guns before I asked a question about them. So the patient has maybe two seconds, but that's much more than is required to process, uh-oh, question about guns coming. So that instant defensiveness comes and goes before I've asked the question. If that opens the door, I have the conversation and it goes wherever it needs to in that particular encounter. If the patient says, we're not talking about this, my answer is, okay, unless I need to talk about it, I've raised the issue and that's gonna be enough. We're back to whatever the topic was. I'm gonna stop with the example. I'm just gonna mention that last bullet. People are concerned, we'll talk about this again in just a moment, um, about the reaction. I have had one hostile reaction in decades of bringing this up, in which case I simply said, no problem, we're done here. I redirected and we were back to the conversation. But here's the point, 90% of the public and 85% of gun owners here in California, this is our work, believe that it's entirely appropriate to ask questions about gun, guns in the home if there's risk. So if you've established risk, walk through the door, the patient and the family almost always will be with you. And finally, um, about this, I'll mention, you can disclose HIPAA in the situations we're talking about does not apply. I, I won't read that language, but you can see a pretty extensive quote from the language of HIPAA itself. Basically it's, if there is an imminent threat and you disclose to people who can do something about the threat, you are covered by HIPAA. And imminent doesn't have to mean today or tomorrow. Um, in the code of federal regulations, imminent basically means before a federal regulatory agency can take regulatory action. So, you know, a year from now, two years from now. Um, let me just mention in passing 
extreme risk protection orders. I'll, I'll take a, gladly take a question if there is one, um, but this is something like a domestic violence restraining order that if you encounter a true emergency, I put a gun to my head, doctor, I put the gun down and decided to come to the emergency department and get help, but the, the, the gun is still on my nightstand at home and I'm not making that up, I've encountered that one. Um, you can call the cops and things can be done to remove that gun from a high risk situation. Gonna move on. Are there benefits to this? I'm gonna move quickly now to save some time. Yes, it works. We have RCTs to prove it. We need a lot more evidence on, on effective efficacy one way or the other. Are there barriers? Sure there are. Don't know enough about guns. Talked about that. Risks and benefits, the same. Don't have time. When do we ever prioritize? Effectiveness and, and reaction, we've talked about. There are health professionals who say, I am not gonna have anything to do with this. I don't think it's a problem. I don't think it's the role of the physician. To them, I say, no problem. Right now, one five percent of physicians ask these questions, even when it's relevant. If I could get one five to 50, that would be great. And the 10% of it who say, I'm never gonna do this, that's fine, you're on your own. I mentioned that the job's gotten easier. This is one of many resources now available. I put this one up um, because we developed it. Um, this is a state funded project. You'll get the, the URL for it at the end of the talk um, that has videos, webinars, tutorials, links to resources, all kinds of stuff on how to step up in the one-to-one -one kind of situation um, that I've been describing. Um, we're gonna be rolling out a very much expanded training program for residents um, and for actually for clinicians of all types, physicians, nurses, paramedics um, over the next year or so. We would have done it already, but the, pan it, the pandemic got in the way as it has of so much else. Let me switch horses a bit and talk about some of the other kinds of stuff that you can do. When I was going through training, we talked about refocusing upstream. I don't know if that metaphor is still used or not, but it still works. It's very clear that risk for violence is predominantly socially determined. And if we do not focus on those social determinants, the work we do at the individual level will have relatively little impact. Um, let me give you some models. Um, one of mine is uh, Rudolf Virchow, um, who as an investigator went to look at risks for what lay behind an, an epidemic of um, typhus, actually an infectious disease um, in his home country and came back with an epiphany that led him to write one of the smartest things a physician has ever said in my judgment, that medicine is a social science and politics, nothing but medicine at a larger scale. He actually had electoral politics in mind, but more broadly, we still take that very much to heart. Um, people usually put the, a photograph of Firkow when he's old and has a gray beard and stuff up. But um, when he said, when he wrote that, he was 26 or 27. So residents in the audience, that's a hint. Don't wait, do it now. Um, in our own time, Paul Farmer, uh, the second photograph, a hero of mine um, whose epiphany came from work in Haiti, um, who wrote uh, and writes um, very eloquently about embodiment, about how an individual's health status is the physical embodiment of, this, of the disparities of disparities in the society um, in which they live. Um, I won't re repeat what you've seen on the slide already. You can see areas of focus that, that, um, that I've taken on. I've, I've been asked to, to answer the question sort of up front, how'd you all get into this? Um, for me, um, that, that moment of change in career trajectory came from spending five months in Cambodia, right after Pol Pot time, when I saw the effect of violence on entire society. It's thinking I'm gonna work in international health 
and then realized, you know, there's plenty to do right here. Um, and I've stuck with it. And if people want to talk about that further, I'm happy to do that. Um, and I'll just end by saying out loud that last bullet point here. Don't look left. Don't look right. Look inside. Now, like any other day, is not the time for somebody to do something. It's the time for each one of us to say, it's time for me to do something. Um, and I will stop there. Here's how to reach me. Here's how to reach our program. Um, here's how to reach um, bullet points. And I'm sorry, uh, Margo, I apologize. Um, Margo asked me folks to um, say several times during the presentation, hey, everybody, don't forget to put in your questions. And I, I got caught up in the flow. I didn't do that. So here at the end, um, hey, everybody, if you haven't already, please put in your questions. We've got time. Um, I'm going to stop screen sharing. Thank you, Darren. And, for an, for yep, go for it, Margo. Thank you for an amazingly powerful and I have to say kind of disturbing presentation that is just a real, I think, call to advocacy um, and action for all of us. Um, I'm looking in the in the from the questions and there's two questions that are really both related to um, to sort of screening using EHR data um, regarding um, violence and gun violence. And I was wondering if you'd be able to talk a little bit about that. Thanks. Yes. Um, so first off, a, a shout out, uh, Kirsten. Hi, nice to see you too. Um, EHR data has tremendous potential that is only just being unlocked, I think. Um, first off, systematic entry uh, is key. And it's still the case that health systems, uh, there are plenty of exceptions now, but health systems don't routinely um, solicit information on access to firearms as part of, of intake interviews. Um, but we've started, and other people are doing this kind of work too, mining EHR data for phrases that suggest access to firearms. We're doing it right now only for research purposes, so through an IRB and so on. Um, but Kaiser, at a minimum, uh, is doing this now uh, to help guide preventive care. And, and down the road, um, I think it's going to be one of the, the keystones of any sort of foundation we build of systematic prevention work. Because to, to go back and to the analogy I used earlier, the one-to-one the -one risk based encounters that I talked about um, are a risk based approach. Um, but for us to be effective, we need to adopt as well a population based approach. And a population based approach is going to involve systematic, systematic data and systematic review of those data. Thank you for answering that. And I, I should have mentioned that those questions were from Stuart, who was uh, asking about PAMF, uh, talking about the social his, uh, history section in APEX. Um, with two questions related to um, firearms and Anusha who, um, who asked about predictive EHR data um, to ping the clinician with their risk factors for violence. Um, I had a different, I'm hoping, first of all, I'm hoping other people will put in thoughts or questions in the chat because this is usually a very interactive group with lots of great questions and I know you've got them, so put them in please. Um, the question that I had um, uh, is, whether or not, oh, actually, I see Stuart just added a question here. I'll, I'll ask, I'm gonna ask Stuart's question before I ask my own then, which is, um, uh, can we do something similar at UCSF? We've got Kevin as a panelist, so I don't wanna put you on the spot there, Kevin, but I think this is perhaps a question for you. Uh, hi, maybe Orego, if you could, uh, um, there we go, thanks, hi. Hi, uh, Garen, thank you so much. Uh, nice to have you with us. Um, yeah, I think the, it's sort of the action agenda, which I think Stuart is raising one, and I think maybe we should really think about concrete steps. So one would be, I think Stuart, Stuart is saying, should we at UCSF Health, the San Francisco Health Network slash San Francisco General Hospital, should this be part of the routine intake 
uh, modeled on, I guess what Stuart is saying was used at Palo Alto Medical Foundation with a two question epic prompt, are there firearms in your home? And if yes, are they secured with a trigger locker and a gun locker at all times would not be used, Karen? I wonder if that's what Kaiser has adopted. And then, you know, the question I think for me in an institutional position is we're a little bit struggling with overload of screening questions of social, you know, there's question now screening for housing insecurity and food insecurity and for falls. And there's a bit of, even if you put screening questions on, are they administered? Are they paid attention to? So I don't know, Garen, maybe I, I think Stuart, I'm going to punt and not say, yes, I'm ready to take this on and immediately say, I'm going to go champion the implementation. I guess I want to hear from Garen. Is there any evidence that this can be done systematically? And if so, does it actually help at least on the individual encounter level to, uh, to uh, maybe have any outcomes around better safe storage and things like that of fire. Yep, so um, it, the simple answer is yes times two and I'll get uh, a little bit more specific. Um, understood about um, overload uh, on screening. Um, I've always wondered why we assume that we have to do all of that at one time. Um, the, the, in, the systematic uh, uh, intake of information can be done in increments. Um, and so, and there are some other sort of tweaks that, that can, can reduce the burden. Um, this is the, th these are the right two questions to ask. Other people use slightly different phrasings and uh, Kaiser, I think has a different phrasing. Um, but, but what you wanna know is, is there access and is there uncontrolled access? Um, if the answers to these questions are, uh, actually, even if the answers to both questions are yes, but not as part of a, a routine questionnaire intake, but during an encounter, it might be worth fleshing out. So who, if the guns are locked up, who has the keys or is it a combination? So is the key mental only, all that sort of stuff. Um, and because the significance of the answers to the questions, as we all know, is a little bit context dependent. On benefit, there, is good, there are good data that intervening when there is uncontrolled access leads to controlled access. Um, it doesn't, it's, it's uncommon to get people to go, oh, what an idiot I've been. I'm gonna get the guns out of my house. That doesn't happen often enough to make it a realistic objective. But you know, maybe I should lock them up um, is a reasonable objective um, and that prevents impulsive access, which underlies suicide and much of domestic homicide. It prevents access by ineligible people like children. Um, school shooting, guns used in school shootings tend to come from the parents' home, um, et cetera. So I, I think all of this is worth implementing on a sustainable basis, given the evidence we have at the moment. CDC at the moment is spending a lot of money funding research that will help hopefully provide more robust evidence. But what we have now is encouraging. I will say this, one more thing on intervention. Telling people, okay, you gotta lock the guns up, tends not to work unless the hardware is part of the package. If you're gonna tell people lock guns up, give them the lock. Um, if you're gonna tell them, no, you need a safe, give them a voucher for the cost of the safe. Um, we've learned this in many other contexts too. If there's a cost barrier that has to be crossed in order to implement whatever it is we're asking people to do, um, that barrier will be insurmountable. Thank you for that thoughtful answer. That's really interesting. I wanna make sure that we save time um, for uh, Dina's question, which is also a very thoughtful question, which I'll just read out loud. How does our approach, uh, slash recommended actions to take at the bedside change when we view the data you presented through the racism as a root cause lens, i.e. recognizing that racism is a primary driver behind the disproportionate amount of deaths of young people of color. How does this affect the conversation we're having about violence and safety? Do you have some pearls on how to integrate frank discussions of racism into the gun safety talk? Thanks, Thanks Dina, for asking that question. Yep. So I'm an old white man, I'm 70, just to be specific. Um, and I am never in the room with a patient without being aware of my own demographics as well as theirs. Um, what I do as an individual one-to-one -one 
is I ask kind of the question that I ask of others. How can I help you? Let's talk about, from your perspective, what help you see as useful. I can provide what you need. Um, as a non-traditional clinician, um, I work to help encourage the adoption of hospital-based violence intervention programs. We have one, you have one. Um, I work to change policies that have a racist genesis. Um, I work as a researcher, I should mention, um, and our group does, sorry, I'm claiming too much credit here. Um, our group works collaboratively to help identify the racism and for that matter, the sexism and other, sorry, I live on a noisy street. My office is on a noisy street. Um, uh, the other, um, I'm going to say disparities, but that's not the word that I want, that are baked into the data that we use for our research. Um, I work, I've kind of mentioned this already, explicitly to say, and I should say to you all, that there is a limit to what we can do to prevent firearm violence if our focus is on firearms only and on the people who use them. We need to focus up, upstream on opportunities for education, jobs, employment, housing, if we're really going to make um, access to substance abuse and mental health care, if we are really going to make the kind of progress we would like to make on firearm violence. I also, I, I, two more things and I'll close on, on that answer. I recognize that there are limits inherent to what I can do that stem from who I am as a, as a being. Um, the other thing that I can do, and this is personal, um, is I can help ensure that the people who come behind me and behind my cohort in the kind of work that, that I do um, are more diverse than my cohort is. Um, and I am I'm not gonna go into specifics, but there will be some public announcements going to be um, I'll say investing pretty heavily um, in making that happen. I say, Mark, can I ask one uh, more question? Please. Yeah, please. Or actually, uh, um, well, actually, I see there's one from Naomi. So go, Margaret, do you want to? Uh, I, I think we have a little time. So I'm going to read Naomi's question, and then Kevin, you can we can close with your question. Okay. Um, Naomi asked, have you and your group collaborated with the community organizations doing violence prevention and intervention? And if so, can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Yes. Um, so I have not, um, but our group does a lot and ever more so. Um, we hired, um, for the longest time, there was one faculty member here. Now there are eight. Um, and we have hired several people precisely because of their involvement um, with communities where they came from. Um, they are now involved with communities here um, and nationally because they're nationally recognized experts. As a group, we are working with the state of California on uh, 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 efforts to encourage the adoption of evidence-based violence prevention programs by communities around the state. We hope I used to say expect, I'll stick with hope for the moment, um, that we will, that the nation will get the $5 billion uh, in funding for such programs uh, in the near term uh, that is proposed and the much larger number uh, that is proposed for the longer term. So, so yes, we collectively do a lot of that. Thank you. And Kevin, I want to give you a chance to ask your question. And maybe and one I comment and one, and a, maybe one comment and a question and a half and a half a question, half a comment. But first I want I I want to thank you, um, Garen, but not just for this presentation, which was very stimulating and disturbing, as Marco says, but you know, for your lifetime of work, I want to make sure the audience realizes, you know, this was against huge um, resistance and political impediments. Uh, there was a federal prohibition, you know, enacted on research on firearm public, you know, as a public health problem. And uh, to, to mount the kind of research and ongoing work in this era, and Garen, that you've done, I mean, I just, I know how much determination it took, how much you had to 
figure out creative ways to overcome these obstacles. Um, and I think you're a real credit to just somebody who's so committed to getting the work done and finding a way to do it. And I think it's a great role model for other people working in other areas that are politically controversial. We have a lot of folks working on uh, reproductive health rights with all the politics around abortion. There's issues of racism, but how to keep going even when the political currents may be pushing against the, what you fundamentally, one believes is essential part of um, understanding how to improve the health of our communities and our society. So thank, thank you and really credit to your courage and determination. I think the other thing, you know, you, know, you made it so clear in talking about everything from individual, like what we could do as individual clinicians, health professionals, from one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, it sort of fits with the anti-racism framework. There's stuff you can do individually, interpersonally, there's then structural things when it has to address. So maybe just to close on the structural, Garen, it's, you raised the whole one year anniversary of the January 6th insurrection and um, some of that polling data, which is chilling. And do you wanna maybe just any closing comment on what where we are as a society now with such prevalence of gun ownership? Sure. And now the specter of actually, you know, a coup and insurrection that would be unprecedented really in many ways since the civil war almost. Uh, yeah, I don't want to end on a total downer. Yeah. You're, you're the one who showed that slide, Garrett. So I don't, you so, know, what, what, yeah. what, what, should so, we, what should we make of this now? Yeah, I'm, I'm laughing because I like to end talks on a high note and that's not going to happen. Um, but so, so first off, just on the, the, str the struggle, um, what we now have is written into the laws of California, a firearm violence research center, um, which gets substantial funding from the state every year. Um, we fought for every inch of that. Yesterday, no, day before now, the National Rifle Association filed suit in civil in federal court, um, uh, alleging that our access to uh, research data, which is also now mandated in the law, is unconstitutional. Um, and we'll see what happens with a federal lawsuit. But but we're not the defendants. The attorney general is the defendant, and it's going to be a different game. Um, so. Yes, I, I pulled a punch, Kevin. Um, here's, here's what I think. Um, as I followed the gun purchasing data um, and saw what was happening with rates of violence last year, I, I wrote a commentary that um, if I, I'll, I'll take a moment after I'm done and put the link in the chat. Um, I think, and, and many other people do now too, um, that there is a good chance we will see something that looks enough like civil war to deserve that name um, sometime between now and 2024. And I'll put it to you this way. If you ask people, is democracy under threat? Vast majority of the population says yes, Democrats and Republicans alike. Democrats see what's coming and see democracy under threat. Republicans look at 2020 and say an election has already been stolen. We don't agree with them, but that is their motivating belief and we cannot ignore their motivating belief. So the survey research that we're going to be doing is going to be asking of all of these people who bought guns last year, so did you buy a gun because you're getting ready for civil war? Among many other questions. Um, I am very, and, and the plan is to get the data out to the public in the spring. So there's time to do something about it. Um, I am very concerned about the possibility for large scale political violence with the opposing sides, each thinking that they're fighting for the future of democracy and unwilling to back down. So I, let me leave you with a question, if not a high note, folks. The, the question is, what is, and, and you will each need to answer it for yourselves. What is my role? What is the role of medicine, what is the role of health professions, the health, health professions at a time of political instability and likely violence? How do we stand up as leaders and help navigate Scylla and Charybdis here and get through this? I'll stop there. Wow. Um, Garen, I wanna thank you again for a 
profoundly provocative and I'm just going to have to say deeply disturbing presentation that has given us a lot to think about and also a lot to aspire to in our role as healthcare professionals. But I also want to thank you not just for your work today, but for the past 35 years. Um, I agree with Kevin, sustaining it through hurdles and sustaining your commitment is, is really inspirational to us all. So thank you so much for all of your hard work. And um, it sounds like this could actually, your last sentence could be the beginning of a new grand round. So we hope you'll come back sometime in the future, hopefully with good news for us all. Sure. Thank you. Happy to do that. Thank, thank you both. And thank you all back. It's been a real pleasure.